What's up, Meta Nerds? In this video, we'll break down all 25 variants of the B1 series battle droid. Some are straightforward and reasonable, others would have reminded OOMs of the famous quote after the Battle of Naboo, you may stay operational long enough to see Geonosian made horrors beyond your processing ability. The first up is that often confused OOM series battle droid. People think it's technically a different line of droids, but it does come out of the same B1 line. Everything is exactly identical except for a more powerful processor and expanded software programming so that it can fill a specialized role in the Trade Federation Defense Forces, and of course later the CIS. This programming did make them more susceptible to code errors. Since they are identical, this coloring system was used to tell them apart, which isn't just for Nymordian eyes, but also for their fellow droid optic sensors, easily enabling them to sort their allies. The yellow were the commanders, which is the widest range of creative thinking packed into these B1s, and as the name suggests, they would lead and coordinate with their organic general or T-series droid, often being personally responsible for company level formations or as captains of separatist starships. They could even receive a promotion, which in effect came with a software update, allowing them to reliably process even more data and become officers in the CIS. There was a dark parallel of this in the clone troopers who were bred from birth for their intended role. Like the clone commanders, who got the CC designations as opposed to the CT, they had both higher IQ and creativity, so less of the dulling of some of Django's traits in order to reach a happy medium of capable, deadly, yet still obedient clones. So both the organics and droids were programmed from creation to serve the role we see them in during the Clone Wars. The blue were the pilot battle droids and entrusted with operating everything up to cruisers and lucre hulks, as well as gunners for artillery down to ground vehicles like AATs, usually ordering simpler B1 units with a commander up top, using that open hatch to get sensors on their surroundings. All power to the forward shields! What if they attack us from behind? They can't. The red were packed with security programming, and that might seem like the simplest, but in a few ways I could see how that'd be the most difficult. Of the three, the commander being programmed to kill the enemy and choose the best preloaded tactic for the current battle situation, or the pilot operating a craft with preloaded technical data on that craft and navigational data from the environment, I think if we had to make one of these, the murder bot that can fire at the right threat and only the right threat in a crowded place would be by far the most complicated. They could act as snipers down to just close quarters bodyguards, meaning they would hopefully eliminate a threat as soon as they pull that hidden blade, blaster, or explosive, which could come from any organic of thousands of different species, or any droid, and movements may be very similar to a gesture like a bow or handshake. A hint we have that this was the most complex is that we know for sure that the Trade Federation had issues with them in crowd control roles, where they would have to go through regular memory wipes as it quote, strained their logic modules. And if you didn't wipe it quick enough, they could enter into a sort of psychosis and be completely lost to paranoia, the kind of thing that could see the droid firing at everyone. The 631 model was the exact opposite. It did have an identical body, but after the B1 line was modified to have their own droid brains so they weren't reliant on the central control computer, there were still tasks that didn't need as much thinking power as even your standard B1. Those 631s are not the brightest lights on the ship. These had the bare minimum needed to do very specific tasks, often only used in low threat locations, just standing around to discourage any attackers or operating very simple machinery at these locations. Some of these would include droid manufacturing plants themselves, so they helped in the building of all their superior droid brothers, though they were almost always made fun of by even the standard B1. So imagine how much a commando or T-series droid would be astounded by how dumb these things are. These models with the green stripes are the AAT driver battle droids, likely made to save credits. Why put a generalized, more intelligent pilot OOM in a tank, when you can just have the tank driver be specialized in just piloting an AAT? It reduced both production costs with the simpler programming and droid brain, while also reducing maintenance costs with memory wipes, or the risk of code errors flaring up in the field. You were right! Next time, listen to orders! Next we have the Assault and Elite Assault version. These were programmed with Demolition Mastery, with everything from E60R missile launchers, V1 thermal detonators, and the HX2 anti-personnel mines. I'd imagine they're proficient in just about every explosive the CIS produced, and these units were crucial in giving the CIS back their advantage. Republic force multipliers like mounted turrets and vehicles helped the clone troopers overcome the often more than 10 plus droid advantage. With some explosives, the droids had their superpower back. Allowing the standard B1s to overwhelm the clones. 
Oh my dear lord. How is this thing? The B1 Electrostaff droid actually has changes to its chassis, including circuitry, motors, and actuators, in addition to the specialized programming that made it far stronger and agile. And they were so confident in these upgrades that they could take on Jedi sometimes even getting the best of these force wielders. Which makes it a pretty insane variant for a line that was supposed to be all disposable Roger Rogers. The Grenadier is similar with changes made to the torso and optics, perhaps this helped it to be more accurate with these launchers. While the B1A for Air Assault bridges the gap to the B2RP. The torso and many parts of the legs and arms share parts from the larger B2, and it even has the wrist mounted blasters, but also a pair of blades. Their shield could block lightsabers, something we saw in the Cortosis version of the B2, often called the B3 Cortosis droid. Though we don't know which material is used in this one, it could have been Frisk, Beskar, or Cortosis, all of which were known to be materials the CIS was dabbling in during the war. This large device isn't technically a jetpack, it is a repulsor assembly, a smaller version of what all hovercraft use. And it did spark a question I want you guys to answer down in the comments. You think if you went slow enough with a jetpack, you could still move through shields? It is the electrogravitic effect of repulsors that repels off an energy shield like the same sides of a magnet. So let me know what you think in the comments if mandos and rocket droids could fly through shields if they just went slow enough. Sadly for these units though, clone troopers quickly realized they could fire on weak points in this repulsor pack to quickly down them or leave them immobilized. The Assassin gets specialized optics and programs, along with built-in gyroscopic stabilizers. Though we don't get a number, it is said that this simple looking unit was extremely expensive, that making a droid as accurate as an organic sniper was for some reason a lot harder than they expected. And given that the CIS did have organic fighters and tons of hired bounty hunter help, this role was often just met by organics. And these guys were a lot like the explosive specialists, only meant for taking out specific targets. Chewbacca and his pops fought against the Beta B1s between 39 and 36 BBY. It is unclear what is different about them, it's likely just a bit worse and unrefined in every way. Battle Droid Mark II is pretty similar, but the eyes and chassis are different, with the cables connecting the head to the body being outside and running down the back of the head, creating the look of horns. I think this is in between the Beta and B1, and that their rarity during the Clone Wars is due to almost none of them being around two decades later. Or it was in between the B1 and B2. Maybe this seeming step back allowed for some advantage, or made it even cheaper. The Mark III is even odder, with a more flat rectangular head and this bulky comms backpack. Again, I would put this before the B1 model we know and love, when they were still trying to work out the kinks. The Beetle Droid unit is a product of Nymordian culture. Their homeworld, and eventually all of their purse worlds, had whole farms of harvester beetles. You can see in the distance here that they even modeled their harvesting machines after this effective beetle form, which itself was a source of rare fungus that fueled the Nymordian riches. The entire galactic plague that was the Trade Federation could be tracked back to the wealth generated from these beetles. And before and during the Battle of Naboo, these mounted droid units would often fire flamethrowers from the back of these beasts, with the beetles having three levels of armor plating and different weaponry. The mortar droid would fire thermal detonators into the air to try and bring down flying craft or beasts, and could even be lobbed over walls or other blockages to hit enemies out of line of sight, and were effective against light armor and all forms of fleshy organics. The Marine could almost be seen as a type of OOM since it had specialized programming to both pilot enemy ships and sabotage them, and distinguished with the green coloring, devoting all of their processors to defending their own ships on defense or board and destroy enemy capital ships like a Venator from the inside out, requiring specialized tactics, technical understanding, and accuracy since they couldn't rely on overwhelming volley fire tactics of the massive B1 advances. They were taken on clones defending from close quarters. It's a similar story with the orange marked engineers. They were there to repair any vehicle they came across and had programming on slicing into computers and advanced explosive devices. And to make room for all this big brain programming, to understand every schematic the TF could track down, including captured Republic vehicles, they did not have that increased accuracy and make up for this by wielding a shotgun. We get another duality with the flame battle droid marked appropriately in red, with the backpack being filled with a liquid fuel and the arms replaced with throwers. If only the whole Clone Wars wasn't rigged, because this was a genius move to get around both the small physical shields, like those used by elite clone forces, the energy shields of Mandos, and most importantly the lightsabers of Jedi. 
Pushing the evil of Bactoid programmers, these ones were trained to inflict terror. While other droids were carrying out their specialized functions, the flame droid immediately went about attacking innocent civilians, burning down homes, crops, and public spaces, intended to force a quick surrender. But they must have had explicit program overrides, because they were used on Naboo, but just to keep the royal pilots in custody, knowing those saber-slashing freaks were coming. And weirdly enough, there is another model that is blue and fires in a different style, and they're even more rare. While the firefighter units do the opposite, but oddly their backpacks are different and not filled with some chemical agent or water that's used to stop these fires, as they still just rely on hoses. Of course, when compared to the saboteurs and snipers, these units are often forgotten, but they're one of the unsung heroes of major capital ships and bases. The droid you really don't appreciate until you need it. And there are two types of heavy battle droid, one that keeps the same body but equipped with an overcharged E5C heavy blaster rifle, which gains a wooden stock, beefier barrel for a rapid fire, or they could even use the Z6 rotary cannon originally designed for the clones, while having a Mando-style disc shield emitter built into their chest. When this was activated, they would walk much slower, but their legs were vulnerable. The other type seen before the Clone Wars uses this unknown large blaster, likely the same idea of it being a heavy blaster rifle, with a massive backpack full of Tabana gas to support all this fire. The I-10 probe droid is a very strange addition, as it is intended to literally just run around and survey things like a probe droid. In a galaxy where fast-traveling, smaller flying probes seem ubiquitous, this is far weirder than normal Star Wars complaints of exposed bridges, layers of assassins, or rushing in large formations. I can say that they'd likely make it run faster, maybe specialized in sprinting, but nothing indicates that, nor would it really solve the real issue here. If anything, you could say that the unarmed B-1 could be claimed to not be a combatant, and the hilarity of seeing this thing zip around might distract you long enough for a B-1 sniper to take your head off. But truly one of the strangest things to come out of Bactoid Industries. The plasma battle droid was a giant, 12 foot tall monstrosity that shouldn't even be called a variant, but it is listed as one because it follows the same basic design, just scaled up. It also has these green colorings to distinguish it, just so you don't think it was a marine droid that got into some anabolic motor oils. Bactoid hadn't mastered the B-1 at this scale, so it was a bit clunky as it fee fi fo foamed across the battlefront, and they utilized a unique and powerful weapon. Somewhat like the flame droid, this backpack created an ionized plasma that was fired out of these hands in a sort of lightning gun fashion. These bolts were powerful enough to overwhelm a saber block, and they were really only seen during the invasion of Naboo. Though there were high hopes of sicking these on the Republic one day, zapping through clone defenses, with the same idea of flames being able to flow over and around things and spread to cause damage, the lightning bolts could jump across targets and short out electronics in buildings, vehicles, and clone armor. Things that might have withstood the flames. But it seems the Jedi and Gungan's ability to destroy them put a stop to this project. With those guarding the Theed Hangar Great Hall and the swamps near the Gungan ruins, both receiving a rapid disassembly. The rocket battle droid looks the same, but has some subtle changes to its body, like this part for the floodlight. And watch out for those wrist fusion cutters, because if you saw this, it likely meant you were going to suffer a sad death suffocating in space, while the literally cold droid eyes stared out at you laughing in its high-pitched voice. There they go! That somehow you can hear in this thick space of the galaxy far, far away. This color coding seems to be arbitrary, but with the jetpack, cutter, and standard E5 blaster combo, this really was a horrific part of the CIS military. Rivaling the flame droid with the purpose war crime design, as they have no means to capture targets, only to open up their ship or escape pod and either shoot or vent the organics inside. And last, and I assure you it is by far the best, the great, the terrible, the majestic, Ski Battle Droid. And there is indeed lore on this, like I speculated with the ridiculous probe B1. The Ski Droid has all of its programming centered on the simple task of not falling down, and was intended to ski near enemy ranks, distracting and incapacitating them with quote, uncontrollable laughter. I hope you enjoyed these variants, let me know if I missed any. And as for behind the scenes fact, one interesting model known only as Red Shoulders was cut from the Clone Wars TV show, but was intended to have quote, special program sensor tuned up in their body and can make movements like this, meaning it could quickly rotate 360 degrees, which might've been a cool little shock for viewers that felt like they knew the B1's potential just to have it whip around like an owl. There are some discrepancies from the earliest sources on the OOM. Some say that both the command and security droids had low-grade electronic brains, unlike the pilot and infantry droids. But for sure the infantry were the least, and the commander should have the greatest processing ability. That's how it's been in most lore since then. 
Many of these variants come from Galactic Battlegrounds, Clone Wars Adventures, the Obi-Wan game, Power Battles, Battlefront games from the PSP, Jedi Starfighter, or the Episode 3 game. And of course, you could say a lot of these were just made up to make the game more fun, but I was surprised by how much they cared about the lore. Everything from the droid psychosis to the beetle culture of Nemordia, to practical things like the fire and plasma variants being designed for the unique elements within the Republic military, like advanced tech, and of course the Jedi. Please hit that like button, it really is the best way to help me out. Subscribe to see more and check out these videos, I'm sure you'll like them. But most important of all, remember, credits dumped into R&D don't matter when the war is fixed. And the Force will be with you. Always.